As the dawn breaks over the timeless hills of Queensland's northwest, we feel the all-embracing power of nature, and we realise how little control man has over his own destiny in Australia's harsh outback. The early settlers of the Mitchell Grass country soon learned to adapt to the vagaries of nature and to make their production systems and their lifestyles flexible enough to cope with the heat, the drought, the floods, the fire and the locusts, which were all part of the great outback environment. This harsh land has broken many people who would not bend to meet nature's changing moods. But those who stayed and prospered did so because they adapted to nature's demands. This region has been the home of several uniquely Australian developments. The famous Merino sheep studs, the innovative long distance communications, the birthplace of Qantas Airlines and more recently the Stockman's Hall of Fame. Beyond the bitumen the rough and dusty roads lead across the vast grassy plains and past the hard rocky hills to isolated homesteads where rugged individuals have carved a family property out of some of the world's most inhospitable country. This is the country which immortalized the pioneer stockmen and drovers and their persevering woman folk whose faith saw them through great adversity as they doggedly supported their men and brought up their families. We're at the property of Charlie and Anne Fallot, about 100 kilometres southwest of Winton in North Queensland. And we've come here to look at the property plan and the development of a 50,000 acre property in harsh conditions in the northwest. This is mostly wide open Mitchell grass plains with ranges of hard spinifex jump up country giving the runoff that is used in the key line plan on this property down on the heavier soils where the best grass growth is to be obtained. We're expecting today something like 120 people from the grazing industry to come and look at what the Falots have done over a period of 25 years. This is a particularly good example of perseverance and persistence in trying to develop a property plan along key line principles under very difficult conditions. The Queensland competition for property conservation and management was proposed by Mac Drysdale, president of the UGA, as a fitting climax to that organisation's centenary in 1990. Well, the three criteria were basically one of land management systems to look at the resources associated with a particular property and to see how people have utilised those. The second was the general question of uh, stock management, husbandry practice and, and their general approach to that area. And the third one, uh, just as important as the other two, was the question of overall conservation of the resources on their property to ensure the uh, ongoing habitat for uh, the fauna and flora that are found in those areas in natural state. What would you say were the points on which the Falots uh, scored highly in the competition on their place at Carisbrook? 
Well, without doubt, the, the most important aspect of it was the, re the way that they utilised the resource that they did have. I don't believe that the Philots would argue that they have the best uh, natural resources in the state, but they've utilised what they have to its uh, best potential. Secondly, I think most as importantly perhaps is the, the length of time that they've been involved and the depth of uh, consideration that has gone into the uh, overall land management utilisation question on their property. I think that's made them stand out from the others because they have really demonstrated that they have been prepared for a long haul approach to land management and conservation in this area. Mr Eaton, could you tell us what the Queensland Government is doing to encourage a feeling of permanence and land stewardship amongst landholders in Queensland at this stage? Well, we have a, a recent uh, land review committee into land administration and tenures, and in that uh, committee's report to the government is recommendations regarding land tenure and the caring for the land. They've recommended that we should look at some form of incentive, uh, and we believe that now that we've received that report, that it's up to the government now to look at seeing if we can provide those incentives, because it's far easier for the landholder and far better for the government if the landholder acts responsibly and keeps the land in good condition than for the government to try and rehabilitate it after degradation has taken place. The state winner, Charlie Fallot, explained the background and principles he has applied over the past 30 years at Carisbrook. Now we came to Carisbrook in 1960. Uh, times were very, were fairly dry, there were dry years, and over the first few years we did notice that the only resource we had that we weren't able to use was the water that flowed down these uh, watercourses. You can see um, the uh, hills here on my right um, that shed a lot of water. And uh, that water flows across this valley and through the uh, ranges on, on my left down here. We did investigate the uh, more orthodox systems of uh, uh, controlling water, of irrigating uh, land, we found them to be absolutely and completely uneconomic and impracticable uh, or impractical to uh, implement in this part of the country. Uh, we were given a book on key line. The principles of employed in key line allow you to begin your development to begin to receive some benefit from the work that you do right from the beginning. Now, the principles of Keyline involve looking at land a little differently to uh, factors of relative permanence, which are the basis of Keyline. And the, there are eight of these factors, and I'll list them off for you as climate, land shape, water control, farm roads, trees. Uh, fences, buildings and soil. The rising awareness in the rural community of the need to develop sustainable production systems led visitors to travel long distances to inspect the Falot's achievements. There was special interest in the way in which the runoff water from the hard rocky hills was channelled into the Key Line Flood Irrigation Scheme. The most important element of the scheme is the positioning of the diversion banks which have the dual purpose of transporting runoff water to the storage dams and of ponding water on scalded areas behind the banks. Key Line dams are built off the waterways to reduce the amount of siltation. One of the most striking benefits of these banks is the way in which scalded clay pans in the ponded areas have developed dense stands of Mitchell grass. Although this area only receives 12 inches of annual rainfall, runoff from the hills can be a very valuable resource if it is controlled and spread on the most productive clay soils of the plains. Through a series of banks and dams, Charlie Fallot is able to capture all the runoff from Carisbrook in two large dams and use it effectively in the lower lying areas. Homemade valves and sluice gates control the flow from the dams along the supply furrows and into the parallel bays banked up in the grassland. The whole idea is, as Paul Yeomans put it, to slow down the water so that running water is made to walk. With properly planned and maintained banks, all the water that falls on the property is caught and used to grow fodder and stabilize the landscape. 
In addition, the soil is being developed and improved from clay pans to good pasture. One of the problems of heavy clay country is its tendency to form scalded areas with high runoff and sheet erosion. Very little, I think. Um, I, I understand from speaking to old timers and that that uh, there were big clay pans throughout this country uh, when white man first came out here, mm. and indeed a lot of the old coach roads run down yeah. sort of along clay pans. And have they got bigger or smaller over the years? I believe they've decreased in area uh, due to sort of intensive flooding at times and uh, and uh, judicious stocking. Uh, and I think that they're they're really uh, the, the the paths of old watercourses and that uh, the watercourses move backwards and forwards across these clay pans because right. they're streams of gravel and sand below the surface at times. And what proportion of the landscape is scalded today, do you estimate? Or oh, had a guess. Two or three percent perhaps. Right. Could be more. How would you try and reclaim this land? I think uh, the the well, most economical way is uh, is to pond water on these clay pans. And, uh, and how long would you want the water to pond there? How many days would you see is long enough? Uh, as long as it just goes across it, I would think a matter of a, an hour or two is right. ample. Charlie, tell me about the, the ripping that you do as part of the key line plan. How do you rip and why did you choose this implement? Um, we rip the, rip the soil for two reasons, uh, Brian, in, in key line. The first one is to aerate it, to uh, open it up, uh, and, the, and secondly, we use the, the uh, cultivation, uh, because of the pattern we follow, as a method of water control, of spreading the water. And uh, the reason why we employ this, this implement here, or use this implement here, is because it's been designed really by, by yeomans, uh, in conjunction with the key line system to uh, just tunnel or aerate the, the soil. It doesn't turn it over and it, it, it hardly disturbs the surface. And how um, deep on those does it go down? What, what depth do you like um, on, the, on the tines themselves? We plough probably between 8 and 12 inches here. In terms of drought resistance and productivity, Australia's Mitchell grass country is some of the best in the world. In Queensland's northwest, this grass has been the cornerstone of the wool industry for over a hundred years. Charlie, how many kinds of Mitchell grass are there here? What's this one, for instance? I think that's uh, Curly Mitchell. Right. Uh, the brown ones. And, and we have Curly Mitchell and Hoop Mitchell and Bull Mitchell. Just the three. Just the three that uh, uh, the major species in these areas. They all but grow equally well. Um, the Curly Mitchell grows very well in these harder areas and harder country. And uh, as you see here, the stands become established. Uh, fairly rapidly in this ponded area, or in this flooded area, mm. I should say, mm. and uh, uh, it's really opened up, because it has such a uh, great extensive root system, the Mitchell grass, I believe it's a, it's a wonderful tool for opening up a clay pen if you can just get it to germinate on it. Right, and you, you still get the, uh, the Flinders grass and the Button grass coming in between, as it does on the unflooded country? Yes, and we just, uh, we just have to walk in there a bit further and uh, we see that there's quite a good balance of pasture. Um, now what happens to the little salt bushes in between and the blue bushes? Do they still stick around here? Do you get that herbage? Well they're not, uh, you know, they're fairly extensive where there's no uh, perennial grasses, mm -hmm. uh, but still there's still traces of them always. I think that uh, uh, when you create the right conditions the, balance, the pasture is always balanced. Mm. It's when we uh, destroy the natural uh, conditions uh, may deteriorate, then it causes imbalance mm. in the past. Mm. Right. Banjo Patterson wrote Waltzing Matilda in this district, and it epitomizes the social history of the squatters and the swagmen who are all part of the great shearer strike in the 1880s. Merino sheep expanded in the Winton area as soon as permanent waters were developed, but their numbers and their hard hooves had an ecological impact which this area could not absorb without upsetting the balance of nature. The sheep numbers on Carisbrook have been very carefully controlled and conservative stocking over 30 years has paid off in terms of wool yields per sheep and eliminating the need for drought assistance. 
the next generation of Falots can look forward to reaping the benefits of Charlie and Anne's stewardship. Fauna and flora conservation was one of the three main judging criteria in the property competition. Carris Brook has several thousand hectares reserved for wildlife and tourism. Adrian, your organisation has a particular interest in rural nature conservation. What do you see as the importance of rural nature conservation in the northwest? Well, in the northwest, just the same as anywhere in Queensland, 95% of the state is in private ownership, leasehold or, or freehold, and it's absolutely vital to the protection of wildlife, of plants and animals, that uh, we see uh, good protection of native areas on, um, on farming properties. Given that there's an increasing interest in rural nature conservation on properties, what kind of things would you advise property holders to do to improve the habitat and encourage wildlife on their place? In the uh, last year or so we've moved forward leaps and bounds in terms of uh, understanding by people in the bush about the importance of animals and plants through the, the rise of the land care movement. Uh, we have seen uh, people actually seriously thinking about what to do on their own property. Uh, if we're going to protect endangered species, this is absolutely vital. We're not going to be able to protect endangered species solely on national parks. We have to see protection of their habitat on uh, private property, on leasehold right around the state. The competition and the follow-up program of field days were organised by Gordon Stone, an applied science graduate with the UGA. The response to this uh, competition was very slow to start off with, but uh, the response ultimately was very gratifying. Something like 70 entrants statewide, and we felt this was uh, a tremendous response. Uh, as we predicted, most of the entries initially came from the southern parts of the state where land care is, an, is a known and, and well publicised issue. But the interest from the central and western areas was extremely interesting because there were some particularly innovative properties that, that came forward. A small number but very innovative. The follow up to the competition might be as important as the competition itself. What do you see happening from here on in? The UGA always felt that the follow-up to the competition was just as important, if not more important, than the competition itself. We felt it extremely important once we had the information uh, from property owners to be able to make that widely available. In the lead-up to the field at Winton, we found the interest in urban areas, as well as the rural areas, has been uh, amazing. Uh, I've, some interviews on ABC radio and commercial radio in Brisbane has indicated very great interest in, in the uh, positive, successful case studies. But we also feel that the graziers themselves need to be able to look over the fence onto some of these winning properties to find what practices they can use themselves. Charlie, what do you think the woman's contribution can be to property development on the, the family place? The, uh, the family involvement in development, Brian, I think is a, is a very wonderful one and uh, I think it's very necessary that the, that the woman uh, has, the, has the part in it and uh, she plays a very major role, I can tell you. What, uh, what things are women more sensitive about, do you think? Well, they're sensitive to the, any change in the environment. They're sensitive to the, uh, to the uh, uh, balance of the environment, I'm sure, the trees and grasses and, uh, uh, and soil uh, behaviours and uh, I think that uh, they sense very uh, readily any change in that environment, any degradation in soil or, or, or disappearing of trees or grasses and just as they very readily sense too any improvement in those things. Can we take our, our mothering and nurturing abilities uh, to the land? Yes, definitely. We can, uh, we can cultivate that land and our gardens. We can make the, the land a, a place of beauty where it was very harsh and bare. The images which most Australians have of environmental protection or nature conservation or land use are usually of forests and woodlands in the humid coastal areas. But three quarters of Queensland is semi-arid. And this country can't use tree planting 
and conservation farming schemes. The principles of sustainable production, of using land within its ecological limits, and the control of stocking rates are the real issues in the dry country. The native plants and animals of the dry pastoral country are well adapted to their harsh environment. We too must learn to adapt and our rural production must be in balance with the natural capability of this environment. This means realistic stocking rates and property sizes large enough for permanent living areas for the landholders who we expect to hold the nation's land in trust through their land stewardship and their animal husbandry. Good land use entails both full use of the land's potential and protection of the land's long-term productive capacity. Economic hardship has led to additional pressure being put on the land to produce more than it can sustain. Australia now needs policies which plough back a greater proportion of our wealth into maintaining these productive resources. For a long time this nation has taken and not given back. And for 200 years we have been making withdrawals but not making deposits in our bank account of natural riches. So we've learnt a lot of things from the Falots today about their property, but what are the lessons that we can take with us from a day like this? Today land care means many different things to many people. Out here in the harsh outback, land care consists of good stock management and the full use of the limited moisture that we have. It's important at this stage for city dwellers and rural people to recognize that there are many different ways in which landholders and others can contribute to improving our land, improving its productivity and its stability. As we go forward in the first years of the decade of land care, we must take up in each shire those important land problems that need attention. There are many ways that this can be done by the Shire Land Care Committees, but with the help of government, consultants, specialists, and the support of the city people. We all have a contribution to make. And I believe that with the kind of example that has been set out here by the Falots, we can all not only learn how to go about this difficult task, but what our contribution might be so that we gain not only a better understanding of land stewardship, but that we all embrace the land ethic in its full practical implication. <laughs>